I'd uh, ask you to take your Bibles, if you would, and turn to 1 Peter. And uh, if you would, also please stand as we read this passage, 1 Peter, chapter 2. We're going to be reading verses 11 through 17. 1 Peter, chapter 2, verses 11 through 17. Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh, which wage war against your soul. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable, so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. Be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether it be to the emperor as supreme, or to governors as sent by him, to punish those who do evil, and to praise those who do good. For this is the will of God, that by doing good you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. Live as people who are free, not using your freedom as a cover-up for evil, but living as servants of God. Honor everyone, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the emperor. May God bless the reading of his word. Thank you. You may be seated. What a tremendous passage this is. It's just as I was reading it um, and thinking about the topic we've been discussing, uh, think about verse 16. Let me just highlight that for a moment. He says to these people, live as people who are free. Now, it's interesting. If you know the group of people that Peter's writing to, technically, we would not have called what they have politically freedom. They are a church that's being persecuted. They're being dragged out of their homes because they're Christians. They're being thrown into coliseums and, and used for sport. That doesn't sound like freedom, does it? But yet, Peter says to them, live as people who are free. And that goes to show us that freedom is so much more than just what happens physically the here and now. It's that I am free from the consequences of my sin. I'm free in Jesus Christ. I have something that this world can never take away, no matter what they try to do. But he still charges them, live as people who are free. And you have this freedom now. You have this freedom from death. You don't have to fear that. And so use this freedom, he says, not to do whatever you want, not to cover up evil, not to live a sinful life, but to live as servants of God. Use it to serve others. And of course, how we are doing that is how we relate to the authorities that God has placed in our lives, the, the institutions, as he calls it here, the, the governors, and, and, and honor the, the emperor, the king, or say the president, however your government is structured. That's what he's calling us to as Christians. And of course, last Sunday we started to examine the important topic of how to live under imperfect authority. And we did so by laying out three biblical principles of submission. The first principle we saw is that submission is defined as a voluntarily placing yourself under the authority of the leadership you are over. That's over you, excuse me. Meaning submission is a choice that we make. It is an act of our will. I want to add some clarifications to this, and let me say it this way. We're not going to say everything that there is to say about this whole idea of biblical submission, either last week or, or this week. There's so much more we could say about it. But I do want to make some clarifications this morning. So submission is, first of all, it's my choice. It's not that somebody should be making me submit. It's what I'm choosing to do. Uh, but with that, here's some good clarifications. Me submitting or you submitting to somebody else does not mean that you are inferior to that person. It does not mean that you have less worth or less value because you choose to submit to them. 
And I say that because in our world today, sadly, the world has taken on this idea of submission and they've stolen it from what God has defined and they have this wrong idea. And so when you say to them, well, you need to submit, those type of ideas come to their head. And so we need to make sure as Christians, we are looking at what God says about this idea of submission. So it does not mean that you are somehow less of a person because you submit to somebody else. Uh, in fact, this word submission, as we talked about last week, is, is a military term. Uh, it means to arrange yourself in rank under. So think about that as military. I mean, you have a commanding officer who calls the shots, right? Now think about that. Is the private, we call it the lowly private, are they less of a person than the commanding officer? Do they have less value, less meaning? Are they less intelligent? We all say, no. But you have to have a structure in place so that you can accomplish the mission that you're doing. And so in any organization, and really in any relationship, there has to be a plan for function and for order, or else you're going to have chaos. So if we take that idea of military, when you're trying to do uh, conquer a battlefield, you have the one main guy saying, here's our battle plan, go and execute it. And then you have platoons and squadrons and all those who have leaders over them, and they're trying to work together to do the plan. But you can't have everybody, the average everyday soldier, just saying, well, I don't want to go on that, I want to go over here. No, you have to work together. And even within that structure, there's freedom of, you know, the commanding officer saying, you know what, you need to hold this position right here. I don't care how you do it, but you hold. You and your men hold this. And so he has the freedom to maneuver his new men and, and do that. And so this is a very important principle for us to get right off the bat. And so you're choosing to do that. You're choosing to place yourself under that rank so that things can be accomplished. And it really has to do with, as I thought about this week, it has to do with responsibilities. Everybody has their own responsibilities. Everybody has their roles to fulfill. And if we're not willing to do that, then it's going to just chaos is going to reign. Well, the second thing we saw is that submission is commanded by God. This is something that God says, thus saith the Lord, you must obey. You must submit. As he clearly says here, be subject, verse 13, for the Lord's sake to every human institution. Well, that word subject is submission. Be in submission to every human institution. And so God is commanding us to do this. So if I'm going to submit to God, that also means I need to submit to the institutions he's put over me in my life. Now, that means even to those authorities that do fail. And as we talked last Sunday, we know that authority does fail. This side of eternity, any human authority is going to mess up, is going to get it wrong. No matter how good of a leader they are, how wise of a leader they are, all human authorities are going to get it wrong sometime. But God still says you submit to those authorities. And when we actually do that, here's the key. We are actually reflecting the character of God. Did you know that within the Trinity, there's actually uh, roles and responsibilities? That they're submissive to one another? God the Father is, if you would, they're all God. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. All three are God. But God the Father is, if you would, he is in charge. God the Son does what God the Father wants. The Holy Spirit has come to do the work of Jesus Christ and would point to Christ. And so even within this perfect Godhead of the Trinity, there is order and there is structure. John chapter 14, verse 31, kind of actually uh, proves this a little bit. It proves what we are doing we are actually showing love for God when we submit to one another, when we submit to our authorities. Because there it talks about how Jesus 
did what the Father wanted him to do out of love for his Father. In fact, as we get into the, the Gospel of John next week, we're going to start to see more and more this, this little phrase of Jesus says, I have come to do the will of my Father. What, what does that mean? That means Jesus is putting himself under someone else and saying, I voluntarily do what you ask me to do. I think that's even more significant when we uh, get into uh, the Gospel of John. I think it's in John 10 where Jesus says that no one takes my life from me. I give my life. I voluntarily give it. No one forced him to lay down his life. He chose to do that in submission to the Father. And so when we submit to our authorities, even authorities that fail, even authorities that say to us, I don't... I want you to do that, and we would say, I don't like that. I don't want to do that. We're actually reflecting who God is. And of course, the third principle we saw is that no human authority is ever given all of God's authority. And this is really important for us to remember. I think really important in our day and age especially. And what that simply means is if authority in my life, a human authority in my life, no matter who it is, if they ask me to violate and disobey the word of God, I can say no. I should say no. Because I answer to a higher authority. That's important. Now, the, the discernment comes when are they asking me, as we're going to talk about in a little bit, are they asking me to actually sin? Or are they asking me just to do something that I don't prefer to do? That's the distinction we need to make. But I, I think there will be coming a time when, let's say, our government is going to start asking Christians to do things that violate the Word of God. We're on that line now, as California has proven it's a sticky situation. And so we need to make sure we understand what is God calling us to as his people. Well, today we want to answer the practical question of how does God want us to respond when authorities fail in our life, they fail us, how do we respond in a way that pleases Jesus Christ and recognizes God as our supreme authority? And that really, this is really the first and foremost question we need to consider, no matter the topic we're discussing in our life. And that's my personal responsibility. First and foremost, it doesn't matter what everybody else may be doing. I cannot say, well, they did that and they did. That is, let's say it this way, that is the nature of of all of us, and that is certainly the nature of our day. I am a victim. I wouldn't have done this if everybody else hadn't have done that. God says that there's no room for that. I am always responsible for my attitudes and my actions personally before God. And so the question becomes, am I pleasing Jesus Christ by being obedient to his word? And one reason we're doing this, the last, this, last week and this week, say, is because, let's be honest, the past several months, we have been asked time and time again to do a lot of things that we don't really want to do, right, by the authorities in our lives. Whether it's our government, maybe our parents, our church leaders, our teachers, our administrators, you our bosses, you name it, right? You have to wear a mask. You have to six feet social distancing. You can't go here. You can't go there. And so after a while, it wears on you, doesn't it? And so I thought, you know, we, we need to look at what is God's perspective on this? And what should we be doing and not doing? So let's look at what is God's plan for our victory under authority that fails? And we're going to look at two areas that we need to change. And that's the key. Looking at this in the eyes of, do I need to change some attitude or some action that I'm doing? Well, the first thing is this. We need to change the way we think when authority in our life does fail. Now, I'm going to say this right off the bat. What I'm about ready to present to you 
this is not going to be anything profound. It's simply going to be remembering and applying what we already say we believe on to this topic. Meaning, true theology is lived out theology. It's one thing for us to say, well, I believe this about God, or I believe this about this topic, or I believe the Bible says this, but then not actually connect it to, okay, what does that mean for how I live? So, for example, we can say, until the cows come home, we believe that God is a sovereign God. But the attitudes we display and the actions we take will actually reveal, do I believe that? How I live my life and make my choices, do I actually believe that God is in control? So what do we need to change about our thinking? Well, really, we just need to start by remembering God's character. Remembering who God is. So that first thing, remembering that God is in control. Proverbs 21.1 says, The king's heart is like channels of water in the hand of the Lord. He turns it wherever he wishes. Do you believe that? Is that only applied to the king? Does that apply to every leader? God is in control of the president. He is in control of Congress. Even when they do things that we know they shouldn't do. Even when they make decisions we know they shouldn't make that are violating the word of God, God is still in control. And we've seen, if you look at history, we see how God uses even evil leadership to accomplish his purpose. Because that, what, that's what it means to be sovereign. That he can take that and use it for his good purposes. We also need to remember in that that God is working for our good. He's working for our good. Romans chapter 8, verses 28 and 29. Genesis chapter 20, verse, uh, excuse me, verse, uh, chapter 50, verse 20. Where Joseph said to his brothers, you intended this thing for evil against me. But God meant it for good. That's God being sovereign and looking out for us. I love what Jerry Bridges says about this attribute. He says, God never pursues his glory at the expense of my good, he never pursues my good at the expense of his glory. Meaning God will keep everything in perfect balance because he is sovereign and able to do that. We have to remember that he will help us endure even hardship. As 1 Corinthians 10, 13 says, he will help us endure whatever temptation, whatever trial we're dealing with. Because that's God's promise to his children. So change your thinking in the sense of change how you think about God and remember these truths. Second of all, thank him for everything. Thank God for everything. Anybody squirming? Thank God that you have to wear a mask this morning. What? But thank God specifically for the authorities that he has placed in your life. Ephesians chapter 5 verse 20 is a wonderful verse that if we really applied this verse, it I think would make a dramatic change in our life. It says, always give thanks for all things in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to God even the Father. Always give thanks for some things. No, for what? All things in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ to God. All things, yes. Thank the Lord for that authority. Because there's a bigger picture going on. There's a broader perspective we need to take in the things that happen in our life. It's interesting, that's verse 20. Verse 21 then says this, and be subject to one another in the fear of Christ. Right after he says, you just should give thanks for everything, then he says, oh, by the way, submit to, every, submit to one another. Wow. 
I was thinking about that this week, this idea of submission. It's not always the case, but I think a lot of times in our life, submission comes down to actually, I'm going to give preference to someone else. Because that's really what is at stake. I want this. I want my way. This person says, no, I want this way. And so you have this conflict, right? God has called us to give preference to one another. That's what mutual submission in the body of Christ looks like. Is I'm not only going to look out for my own interest and my own desires and my own thoughts and feelings. I'm going to look out for their interest and their thoughts. And well, what do they want? And try to keep those things in in check. Third thing is this. Trust God ultimately. Place your ultimate trust in God, not in the authority. I love Habakkuk 3, 17 through 19. Great reference there. Now, let me make this clarification. God is not saying don't trust people. He's simply saying our ultimate trust can never be just in people. We must trust him more than anyone else. Why? Because people will fail. Even the most trustworthy people will still fail. I think people, like, people are so often blown away when authorities or leaders that they, they have looked up to and they've trusted, when they fail and they, and they come plummeting down and they have maybe a great fall, is because honestly, they really were not following the right person. They were following that human person instead of following God and trusting him. And so they put this leader, if you would, up on a pedestal. Sadly, that happens a lot, often with pastors. Put them on this pedestal, and then, and then the person kind of really messes up, and, and, and their world is just torn apart. Now again, I'm balancing this. I'm not saying that authority should not be trustworthy. That they should not strive for integrity, because the Bible clearly says that is what should be. But the reality is, in a sin-cursed world, they're still going to fail. Your teacher is still going to mess up. Your pastor, your deacons, still going to make bad calls. How do you think about it when they do fail? The next thing is we need to depend on God's grace. 2 Corinthians 9, 8 talks about, this really is the key here. Grace must characterize our relationships. I need grace to be able to trust God. I need grace to be able to extend that grace to others that fail. Let me kind of give some practical questions to ask yourself when you think the authority is wrong. When you think they've made this decision, you're like, I don't agree with this decision. I don't like this decision. I don't want to have to submit to this decision. What should you do? Well, first of all, you need to ask as a Christian, what biblical standard are you using? Are they asking you to violate the word of God? Are they asking you to violate your conscience sincerely? Make sure the standard is not, well, this is my standard versus this is God's standard. Make sure you do not turn your preferences into convictions. Well, I would prefer it this way. Second, you have to ask yourself this question when you're upset with your authority. Is the authority really wrong or is this simply something you don't like or don't want to do? Can you really understand why they're asking you to do that, even though you're upset about it? Even though you're like, man, this just messes up my plans. I do not like that I have to do this. Are they wrong in doing that? Or is it just, I don't like it, so I don't want to do it? Third, since no authority is perfect, why are some of their actions more distressing to you than others? Why is this thing that maybe you're really upset about? Why is it so upsetting to you? 
let, let's take this. I'm just going to throw this out there because it's, it's the thing that has become a hot button issue, and that is the masks. Why are we so upset about having to wear masks? Why are we, I, I want to ask, there's been some people, and if you're on social media, you'll definitely see it about the whole mask thing. Okay, I want to ask them, okay, what is it that you're upset about and why? And I really want to know and listen. Why is this thing so upsetting to you? And if we're honest, many times we're upset because it affects us, it impacts us in some way we don't like. Nobody in this room, I would say, let's wear masks for the rest of our lives. Amen? No, wait, no amen. Come on. See, now, this is the, this is the hard part, because I can't see if you're even smiling. Other than Haley, I can see that Haley's not smiling about so now she is. Got it. All right. But nobody wants to do that. But why are we so upset? What's at the heart of that? And that's really what God's getting to is the heart of our thinking. Well, let's look at the second thing we need to change. And that's the way we act when authority fails. How should we act? Well, first thing, as Christians, we need to be godly examples of a response that pleases the Lord. If I am not submitting myself to the authorities in my life, that means I have no ministry to those who are under my authority. If you, if you complain, if you tear down your boss... For example, what kind of, uh, what kind of uh, example are you leaving for your kids and how they should respect their teachers? How should they respect you and your authority? Oftentimes the things we would not want our kids to do, we often are guilty of doing. We get on them, well, don't, don't, you know, don't talk about your teacher that way, don't, you know, don't, certainly don't talk to me that way. But then they hear us talking about somebody else that we don't like, whether it's the president or Congress or and calling people names. And, well, what are we actually teaching them? It's okay sometimes and not other times. Believers, how will the world around us how are they actually going to ask us for the hope that we have in us, that is the hope of Jesus Christ, if we do the same grumbling and complaining and have the same discontent attitudes that they do about life? I don't have hope. I'm not living in freedom, as Peter says, because I complain about everything the whole world complains about. And so we have to ask this question, how will my submission and my obedience how is that actually going to impact others for the Lord Jesus Christ? We need to pray for our authorities. That's the action we can be taking. 1 Timothy 2, uh, really 1, 1 through 2 talks about that. Pray for those who are in authorities. Every authority. Pray for all people. Next, we need to honor and respect those in authority because of their position, not their necessarily their person. Here's the reality of life. The person themselves can be a very uh, unkind, ungrateful, just the word that comes to mind, they could just be a jerk themselves as a person. We've all known people like that, authorities like that. I am to respect the position and try to strive to honor that position and how I respond to them, how I live with them. I don't have to be best friends with them. Next is we need to focus on our responsibilities. We tend to focus on their responsibilities, right? How they're messing up, what they're not doing, what we think they should be doing as the authority. God says you focus on your responsibilities. My goal, no matter who it is, if my boss or in the church or in our government, my goal ought to be to make the authority as successful as possible. The deacon, Terry, and I've talked about this 
uh, as a church leadership, when we have ideas and we're kicking ideas around as deacons, you know what? If we do this idea, if it's a bad idea, let that idea fail because it's a bad idea, not because we chose not to try to do all we could to make it success, successful. Well, no, eventually, that, that wasn't the best idea we had. So let's just take that, throw that in the garbage can, and start over again. And we waste a lot of energy and a lot of times beating each other up because, well, it was just a stupid idea. And you, I can't believe you had it. Let's move on. Let's move on. But when I work against that idea, because maybe it is a bad idea, or maybe it's not the best idea, but we can't think of another idea. But when I work against that authority and against uh, that idea, then the fault is actually mine. And what has that leader learned? They haven't learned anything. The most important responsibility, of course, is for us to focus on becoming like Jesus Christ. As Romans 8, 28, 29 says, 1 Peter 2, 19 through 23 we need to focus our energy on becoming like Christ in the situation, not just spending all of our energy criticizing the authority. <clears throat> now the truth is we need to return good for evil. Our natural tendency is to return evil with evil. You do this to me, I'm going to do it back to you. You treat me dirty, I'm going to treat you dirty. But all that does is actually condone the bad that has actually been done to me. It doesn't help solve the problem. It only adds to the problem. And so God says, don't retaliate back, even if they have treated you wrongly as an authority. And then finally, when it is appropriate, make an appeal. Make a biblical appeal. Because no authority has been given all authority, you can, uh, you can approach them and if you do it in a respectful and right manner and say, okay, here's what you said. Here's why I have problems with that. Um, can we talk about this? So address your disagreements. Address your problems with your leadership and, and their decisions or, or their failures, but do so in a way that actually honors God and seeks to build them up. And what this means is that you, you don't talk them down all over the place. And if you talk to others first about the situation, maybe it's your boss at work, that conversation must be oriented around a solution and trying to seek counsel, not just to gossip about them. Because gossip will never solve a problem. Talk to your authorities with an open mind, with a respectful tone and come offering help and solutions when appropriate. One of the things we've taught our kids we, a lot is that you can make a biblical appeal to dad and mom. And we've tried to teach them the when and how to do that. Sometimes they've done it right. Sometimes they haven't. Of course, sometimes I've responded right. Sometimes I haven't. But that's part of it. You can come to your authority and say, you know, I've been thinking about this. This bothers me. Here's why. But not, you know, your, your decision was so stupid and it's going to, I mean, nobody's going to respond right to that, are they? That's important. Well, the biblical solution to authority that fails is a godly response. It's not having as our goal to show the authority how wrong they are. And how they need to change. God wants to use the failures of authority in our life so that we become like Jesus Christ. That actually then produces victory in how I respond. And it also prevents me from becoming very bitter in my own heart. 1 Peter chapter 2 verse 23 says this of the Lord Jesus Christ, who of course is our perfect example. He was the ultimate supreme authority, and yet he still submitted himself to earthly, imperfect authorities when he was here on earth. And here's what it says. 
When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but committed himself to him who judges righteously. Beloved, if Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, so submitted himself to his Father's will, should we, his followers, not do the same thing? Should we not have the same mindset as the Lord Jesus Christ? See, that's why we need the gospel. That's what, as we're going to partake of the elements this morning, that's what communion is about, saying, this is why we need Jesus. Because we know we fall way short of this. We fall short of him and his glory. But thanks be to God for his grace who has saved us. Amen? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we turn our attention to rejoicing in the truth of these elements, we thank you for the word of God we've just heard. And we thank you, Lord, that the word, the living word, became flesh and dwelt among us. That, Lord, he knows experientially what it means to live in this broken, sinker's world. He knows what it means to have authorities, whether it's the, the Jewish leaders who wanted to persecute him or the Roman government, his own parents, Lord, make wrong decisions. He knows what it means to live in that kind of situation, and yet he responded always in a way that pleased you. And, of course, he submitted himself fully to you and we are so grateful that he did because we now have a perfect savior who obeyed perfectly in every single way and so he could offer himself as a perfect sacrifice to bring us near again to God we thank you for his finished work on the cross and his resurrection that proves that you God are satisfied with his work we ask it all in Jesus name amen